Oi? Agora tá gravando. Agora tá gravando. Você começou bem. Okay, good morning everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to uh, thank the organizing committee, especially Fernando and Hal for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here not only teaching but also learning a lot. Yesterday I, I already had the opportunity of revising some uh, concepts about proteins, so that's very nice. I'm learning a lot. A lot. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about ion-specific facts on biocolloidal systems. I'm Professor Eduardo Lima from Rio de Janeiro State University. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to start presenting myself. I'm a chemical engineer, so th this is a, the, the, the second school in a row that I'm an, an, engineering, an engineer among physicists. Okay, that, that's nice. But, but you see that my application is more physics than chemical engineer. Uh, at least uh, this line of research that I'm going to present here. Uh, so uh, I'm a chemical engineer by uh, the State University of Maringá, Paraná, in the south of Brazil. Uh, then uh, I got my PhD at UFRJ, and it was a theme very related to this. I studied, uh, with, uh, I applied Poisson Boltzmann equation, so that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. And I did my postdoc in California, University of California, Riverside. And I'm at WESH since 2010. So WESH is located in Rio de Janeiro, as you, as you already know. Uh, there I'm, I coordinate the Lafitte Lab, uh, Interfacial Phenomena and Thermodynamics Laboratory. Uh, we have there three main lines of research. The first one is colloidal and interfacial phenomena. That is more related to this lecture. Uh, there we study, we study interfacial tension, properties and stability of emotions, foam, salts, and application to, to cosmetics and petroleum and food. Uh, we have also a line in thermodynamics where we study especially chemical, uh, chemical and phase equilibria and uh, asphaltine uh, stability. In Rio, the, the, the petroleum science is very uh, strong. And uh, I have a, another line, modeling and simulation of processes, where we apply modeling and simulation to analysis and optimization of chemical engineering processes. So where is located right in front of Maracanã Stadium. So if you, if you see here Maracanã, where is here? And uh, the outline of this first lecture is uh, we start with the classical Poisson-Boltzmann equation and the, the classical DLVO theory. Then we're going to talk a little about uh, Hofmeister effects and thermodynamic properties related to ion specificity. And we, go, we are going to discuss what kind of interactions we, sh we should introduce in the, in the classical Poisson-Boltzmann equation in order to uh, uh, to see ion specific facts. So I'm going to start with this question. Uh, Fernando uh, gave uh, a spoiler last, uh, in his class. Uh, how would you estimate the volume of a cow? So that's my question. What would you do? Go. Come on, let's talk. Yeah, you, you, you go the, straight to spherical cow, but are there other uh, ways of doing that? Cylindrical cow. Is it better than the spherical cow? I think so. <laughs> uh, what about uh, mathematicians? What would they do? Maybe they would try to integrate the cow in volume. Uh, it would take maybe a long, long time, but they, they would eventually get an, an exact answer. Uh, maybe experimental physicists with, with <laughs> throw the cow in a, in a pool so that, that they can get its volume. But it's important to uh, uh, dive the, the head of the cow as well. And 
I put here engineers. Sorry, I, I, I'm an engineer, but, but I, I discovered here that theoretical physicists also like this, the spherical cup. <laughs> so uh, it, it depends on, the, on, on the, the details that we are considering our model. But we engineers, engineers usually apply this and use what we call a safety coefficient of 1.3, for example, so that we can, we can say, oh, no problem, no, nothing is going, is going to be wrong in this place. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with a brief introduction on uh, colloidal science. So I'm going to talk about biocolloidal systems. So first, let's understand or remember what colloids are. So colloids are uh, heterogeneous mixtures. We see them as if they were uh, uh, homogeneous, but they are, are actually heterogeneous, uh, composed at, at least two phases. So we have the continuous phase and the dispersed phase. Uh, at least one of, the, uh, of the, these phases presents a dimension between 1 and, and 1,000 nanometers. We usually say that the particle size is in this range, but it's not necessary to be the particle size. It can be, for example, for foams, it can be the, the, the film thickness uh, in this range. And it's not classified exactly by this, uh, by this range. It, this is not so rigid. Uh, it's classified, colloids are classified usually uh, uh, considering their properties that we'll discuss later. And despite being homogeneous systems, macromolecule solutions, for example, globular proteins solutions, uh, are considered colloids, not because of being heterogeneous, but because of their properties that are very similar or are equal to the colloidal properties. So this is an example of biocolloid. So here we can see a separation that, as, as I said before, it's not so rigid. So we have here the colloidal solutions, and the true solutions uh, have dimensions that are, uh, uh, that are smaller than one nanometer, and here, in the other extreme, we have suspensions. Uh, applications. As a chemical engineer, I'm, I'm also interested in applications too, especially in industry. But we can see that uh, colloids are very common in nature, uh, in, in industry, and in, 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 in our everyday life. Um, it's, you, you, you are also eating and interacting with uh, many colloids. For example, we have beer here. The uh, beer is a colloid, and its foam is also a colloid. There, there is much research, for example, on how to have a, a, a stable uh, foam so that you, you, you can guarantee the, the properties of the beer for a long time. Uh, and I'm going to talk about protein solubility. Here we have a, a very good figure showing the ion-specific effect in protein solubility. So here we have uh, the solubility, log of solubility over uh, solubi uh, reference solubility, and here is the ionic strength uh, that is related to ion concentration, as you know. So we can see here that the solubility of proteins, this is a globular protein, so it's, it is carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, the, uh, the solubility depends on the ionic force. And we can see that these curves increase, and uh, then they usually have a maximum, and then decrease, depending on ionic force. For so far, low ionic force, what we have is what we call salting in effect. So in this part of the curve, uh, we, ha we have uh, a positive slope. So we can see that the solubility increases with ionic strength. And there's this, oh, sorry, it's missing a G here, salting in. Uh, <coughs> So the solubility increases with ionic strength, in, and that's because, uh, especially because of uh, screening effects. So we can say here that saltinin is, doing, is due to 
screening. So it's, uh, uh, we have two particles and we add some salt there and, and the, the screening of those ions uh, increases the, the solubility. Uh, those who are married can understand that. When you, you have children, it's a little more difficult to interact with each other. So it's a kind of screening. <laughs> and then we have a maximum and we have a region where we have salting out. That's what we usually use in industry to precipitate proteins. Oh, sorry. Salting out. And this is related to, especially to two effects. Uh, the, the first one is uh, related to hydration or solvation. When you increase the concentration of ions, uh, these ions compete uh, with the, 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 the colloidal particles uh, for the uh, water molecules. So you have more water molecules uh, related to the solvation of ions and less molecules to solvate the particles. So you decrease solubility of proteins or colloidal particles. So we use that, for example, in industry, as I already said, and uh, the, the, the other uh, effect is related to the double layer. So we have a decrease in the double layer size because uh, if you consider, for example, here the interaction between two particles in a, an electrolyte, for example, you have a double layer around each particle. Uh, we're going to talk more about double layer later in, in this class. And uh, the effect of adding more salt, of, of in, uh, increasing the concentration of ions, is that uh, this double layer shrinks. You have a, a decrease in the double layer size. So, so you, de you decrease this double layer size, you decrease this one, and uh, the effect is that those two particles can get closer to each other. Because when you have an electrolyte, the electrostatic interaction is related to uh, uh, those two uh, double layers, not the direct interaction between the particles, but the interaction between the double layers. So, but why does it shrink? Why does the, the, the size of the double layer decreases? Any guess? So you are increasing salt concentration, increasing ion concentration, and you, you need a lower, a, a smaller volume to uh, neutralize particle size, to uh, uh, screen the, uh, the electrostatic uh, field of each particle. So if you increase concentration, you decrease the size of the double layer. OK? Did you get it? <coughs> so in, in this case, we have salting out effect. So we can see that here in this region, you add salt and decrease the solubility of the globular protein. Uh, another effect that I already talked about uh, is called the Hofmeister effect. And it's, it's, it's actually the ion-specific effect. And you can see that adding sodium chloride is very different uh, to adding uh, uh, potassium chl chloride, for example. Uh, so we can see that potassium chloride is more effective in, in decreasing the solubility of, of this protein than sodium chloride, for example. And we have, uh, if you have potassium sulfate, it's even, uh, uh, the effect is even greater. Uh, does it, this interaction, the, the solubility of proteins depends also on pH, because uh, proteins are ionizable molecules, as you already know, and uh, so uh, its charge depends on pH and, this, uh, and its solubility as well. It depends on temperature, but we cannot change that much temperature because of, pro of the problem of protein denaturation. And it, de it, it depends 
on the presence of organic solvents. As they are soluble in water, they are less soluble in organic solvents. So we are talking about, mainly uh, talking about stability of colloids. Uh, and uh, we can say that most colloids are, are thermodynamic, uh, metastable, or unstable. Uh, some authors say that colloids are, are always thermodynamically unstable, but uh, they usually forget, forget to talk about the entropic contribution. Because if you have two particles and they coagulate, uh, you decrease the, the surface area. So decreasing the surface, surface area as those molecules, the molecules at the surface have a higher energy, you decrease energy. Okay, but you also decrease entropy. So there are two competing effects. And the, the, the property that relates those two effects is the temperature, so it depends on temperature. If you consider the free energy here, you, have, uh, you are decreasing uh, energy and you are decreasing also entropy as you coagulate. So this, uh, this will depend on temperature. Uh, and the properties of colloidal systems depend on the interaction between phases that we call solvation, as you already know, and the interaction between particles. When we talk about the interaction between particles, we can uh, uh, classify the, uh, uh, in, in a very simplistic way uh, in two kinds of interactions. You have electrostatic interactions, there are Coulomb, Poisson, that are related to, 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 to the charge, directly related to the charge of particles, and all the other contributions we call non-electrostatic interactions. For example, Van der Waals, London interactions, that we know that is, is related to, uh, to electrons as well, but we say that it's non-electrostatic. And we have solvation and static repulsion, for example. And when we study the stability of colloids, we use the classical or the modified DLVO theory. So this name DLVO comes from the initials of the authors that proposed independently uh, the, the, this theory. So the Yagin and, and Landau and another uh, work by Vary and Overbeek, they talked about almost the same theory. So we uh, uh, unify their works and call it DLBO theory. And uh, this, this theory, the simplified theory, considers two kinds of interactions. We have the Van der Waals interactions, that here we call Hamaker interactions, so Van der Waals interactions between particles, and uh, we have the electrostatic interactions. So if we write this uh, uh, in means of potential of mean force, we can, we can include here the electrostatic contribution, the Hamaika contribution, and we can add here also a uh, hard sphere contribution, okay, to avoid overlap of particles. So this nice uh, picture from the Halleckville book uh, shows here the double layer repulsion. Usually when we have uh, uh, like charged particles, you, we have repulsion. It's not necessarily always repulsion between uh, uh, particles of the same sign, but usually it's a repulsion. And uh, we have here Van der Waals attraction. Depending on the magnitude of these two curves, we can have different, uh, a different energy total curve. Uh, we can see here that if we have a great repulsion between particles, we have this energy barrier here. But the, the repulsion, if the repulsion is not so high, we can have only attraction. And depending on the combination of these two curves, you can have, we can have this kind of total curve with two minima. We have what we call a primary minimum that is related, uh, that is related here to adhesion. It's the contact between those particles. And we have a secondary minimum that is, uh, uh, is uh, located uh, uh, at a distance that is not so close 
that, that, that is not so small. The particles are not so close to each other. So when we have this primary minimum, we have coagulation. So the, the distance between the particles is close to zero. So we say that they are coagulated. And when we have the secondary minimum, we have flocculation. So in flocculation, we have a certain distance. They, they are in a, in a metastable equilibrium, and we have certain distance between the particles. Uh, usually, coagulation is irreversible, and flocculation is reversible. So we can increase stirring, stir for example. Uh, shaking, we can uh, uh, go to, uh, to this side and increase the distance between the particles, and we have, again, a, uh, a stable collet. At least, it's kinetically stable sometimes. Okay? Any doubt? Questions? We, we, you don't need to, to wait until the end of the, the, the lecture to, to make questions. Please raise your hands and make your questions. And uh, we are interested also in different length scales, length and time scales. So we, we have different approaches that we can use. Uh, you, we have quantum DFT. Uh, so we can use uh, these results, for example, in atomistic MD simulations. We, we, we have coarse grain simulations. Fernando talked about it yesterday. And we have the continuum approach, the macroscopic approach. So we come from the microscopic approach to the macroscopic approach. And, and here we have the mesoscopic approach. I'm going to talk about DFT with you in the second class. But it's, it's not the quantum DFT. It's the classical DFT that we use. And we, I, I'm going to show the difference between those two. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the implicit models, the implicit methods. Uh, here we, we're going to see now Poisson-Boltzmann equation, for example, for Poisson-Boltzmann theory. Uh, and we have mesoscopic uh, 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 approaches, for example, integral equations and DFT. Here I'm talking about DFT, uh, the classical DFT, as I right said. And we have explicit methods, uh, for example, uh, molecular dynamics. And here, uh, of course, as we increase the level of detail, we also increase the required computational time. So sometimes it's interesting, for example, to, uh, to use DFT. There is uh, a, a compromise between details and uh, a feasible uh, computational uh, resource. Uh, and uh, when we talk about the, the DLVO theory, the, the, the attraction is related to van der Waals forces, to van der Waals interactions, and those interactions are called Hamaker interactions. There are van der Waals forces between particles. Uh, and, and those forces, those interactions play uh, a central role in colloidal size. So we have here, oh, sorry, there was a problem here. Uh, van der Waals interaction between two uh, uh, particles. He, here, two molecules. We have uh, this kind of expression one, uh, uh, related to 1 over r to the 6. And uh, for, if we, we are talking about the interaction between a particle and a, a flat surface, for example, or a sphere and a surface, we have to integrate this. We have to sum the contribution between each atom so we, if you consider a continuum, that this, the sum means an integral. So we integrate this, and we obtain this kind of, uh, uh, th this kind of, of expression here that is related to 1 over d to the, to the third. So we have here d is this closest approach distance, okay? the surface to surface distance. And uh, for a sphere, uh, so, so this is for a molecule uh, near surface, and this is for a sphere near a flat surface. There was a problem with, uh, with this. I think this is related to, 
to the different versions of Office software. So, and, and the, this, uh, this expression here is what we call the Hamaker uh, constant. So, we can integrate for different uh, geometries, and we have this, uh, this kind of, of expressions. This is for the energy between uh, the particles, and this is for the force, okay? So, uh, knowing the, the geometry and the distance between the particles, we can calculate the respective uh, Hamaker energy. So we have the first part of that expression. Here, when we talk about the LVO, we, we are calculating this part. Now we are going to concentrate, concentrate on this first part here, that is the electrostatic contribution. So to study the electrostatic contribution, we can use, for example, Poisson-Boltzmann theory. Uh, colloidal particles in water usually present charge. But where does the charge come from? Why those particles are charged? And for particles in water, is it most positive or negative? Let's try to answer the first question. Uh, where does the charge come from? We can have, for example, selective ions adsorption. Uh, we have an example here of uh, uh, silver iodide in potassium, potassium iodide. And uh, we can see that the iodide ion uh, adsorbs to the surface. It, it has a better interaction with the crystals of silver iodide. Uh, so we, ha we can see here that we have a double layer. And we, uh, the, the particle that was uh, originally uh, neutral is now a negative particle. So we can have selective adsorption of ions. And uh, other way of obtaining uh, charged particles is ionization. For example, silica, sand in water. Uh, if you introduce silica in water, we have this uh, silicic acid, and uh, we end up with silicate and uh, uh, hydrogen, so uh, hydrogen ion. So uh, we have this silicate that, uh, that is bind to the, to the surface, so we have again uh, a, a negative particle, and uh, the hydrogen ions are solvated. So again, we have a negative particle. So this is conducting you to the answer to the second uh, question. For particles in water, is it most positive or negative? It's usually negative. But why is it negative? If we uh, see this picture, we have here cation and anion. And those Mickey Mouse uh, molecules here are water. So we have water that hydrates better uh, uh, cations than anions. So uh, cations usually are more hydrated. And also, anions are more polarizable. So because of those two effects, hydration and polarizability, we have that anions usually absorb more to the surface than Cations. That's why we usually have uh, negative uh, particles. Okay? So the answer is negative. And I absorb more than cations. And to study that, we, we use uh, Good Chapman theory, the so called Good Chapman theory, uh, to model the double layer. Uh, the electrical double layer contribution. So uh, we, we know that the electric field attracts counter ions and repels co ions, and the thermal energy randomly disperses these ions. So we have a combined effect of those two that give, uh, 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 that give us a, a nonlinear distribution. So we have here this kind of distribution this is the electrostatic potential. This is the surface potential that we call psi zero. And this is in a, in a distance that we call uh, a shear plane here. 
uh, we, we have the uh, zeta potential. We are going to talk about this in the third class. And if, if, if we see here the ions profiles, we have co-ions here and counter-ions here. We can say that, we can see that the concentration of counter-ions increase, increases as we approach the surface, while the concentrations of co-ions decreases. That's related, of course, with the uh, uh, electrostatic field of the surface, the charged surface. So, uh, if you're going to deduce the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, we, uh, we initially talk about chemical potential, and we are going to use uh, Macmillan-Meyer reference. Somebody, somebody talked about Macmillan-Meyer yesterday. So, the reference here is the, is the electrolyte, uh, not uh, the, the, the pure solvent. And what we have here is the chemical potential expression of an ion I is given by the reference chemical potential plus Boltzmann constant times temperature. And here we have the contribution of the concentration, the ion concentration. So if, if we use uh, another reference, a class, the classical reference, we engineer, uh, in, in engineering, for example, in chemical engineering, in chemistry, we, we sometimes use, we use here more fraction, but here, uh, in this approach, we are using the concentration of ions. Actually, it's the number of ions per unit volume, okay? And uh, if, we consider, if we are going to consider the electrostatic contribution, we have to add the electrostatic energy. The, the electric energy. So we have a, here the particle charge, that is the electron charge, uh, times the, the valence of the particle. And here we have the electrostatic potential. So charge times potential, we have here uh, electric energy. So we call this electrochemical potential. So this, this, this is the expression of the electrochemical potential of ion I in our solvent. In this theory, the solvent is a continuum. So the only property that you will represent the, 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 the solvent is the dielectric constant, as we are going to see, and the permissivity. Uh, chemical potential, we, we can write this, the same electro, electrochemical potential at bulk. So if, if we consider that we are at bulk, so we, we have, again, the reference. KBT, ln of, here we, let, let me see the notation, I'm, I'm using infinity here, so, so this is the bulk concentration of ion I, and uh, we, if we are at bulk, this is zero because the, the electrostatic potential goes to zero. Considering equilibrium, Equilibrium means that chemical potential is uh, uh, constant. So the chemical potential at, uh, here we have chemical potential at bulk. So the chemical potential at any point must be equal to the chemical potential at bulk. By the way, what happens if the chemical potential is not uniform? It's not the same in those two points. Yeah, we, we talked ab about it yesterday, diffusion. Uh, Half talk, talked about this. And uh, so what's the driving force to uh, diffusion? Differ di difference of concentration or, di or difference of chemical potential? So, uh, if, uh, fixed law. Uh, in fixed law, we use the, the gradient of concentration. But this comes from the gradient of chemical potential. Because if we consider, for example, uh, equilibrium between uh, liquid and vapor, liquid vapor equilibrium, you don't have equal concentrations, but you have equal chemical potential. So, you have equilibrium. 
So coming back to here, uh, we can uh, consider that those two chemical potentials are equal. So if, if we consider this, the reference vanishes. So we have KBT of CI plus the energy contribution is equal to KBT ln of bulk concentration. And if we isolate the concentration of ion I at any point, we have this expression that is called Boltzmann distribution. Uh, I was using this wrong. So we have here the exponential of the electric contribution over the thermal contribution. So when we started discussing Goethe Chapman approach, we said that it's related to the electrical energy and to the thermal energy. So if we increase thermal energy, we have a more, a, a more uh, distributed system. We have a more uniform system. And if we increase, increase electrostatic potential, we have a more organized system because we attract more counter ions and we repel more the co ions. So this is related to the Boltzmann distribution. So considering Boltzmann distribution, together with the Poisson equation that relates the electrostatic potential and the volumetric charge density that is given by this expression, we have the so-called Poisson-Boltzmann equation, okay? So this is Boltzmann using a computer. Of course, he didn't use, but I'm sure that he would have loved to. And uh, here we have the more complete expression of the classical Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about the modified Poisson-Boltzmann equation, where we are going to introduce other terms, okay? So, uh, as the, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation is a second-order differential equation, we, we need two boundary conditions, and we have those two kinds of conditions. We can have uh, uh, the, potential, the potential specified of the surface, at the surface, or the charge, the, the, the surface charge specified. So here we have the surface potential, and at bulk, the sur this potential is zero, and here we have the surface uh, charge, and at bulk, it's zero again. So we can rearrange this, for example, for a simple system, a simpler system, where we have planar geometry, uh, uniform uh, dielectric constant, where we have symmetric electrolytes, for example, one one electrolyte, like sodium chloride, or two two electrolyte. Uh, we can write this, so we have a second, uh, in, uh, in Cartesian uh, geometry, we have a second order derivative, and we can, uh, as this dielectric constant is uniform, it comes here and, and it goes down, and we have this expression with two contributions, so this is the anion and this is the cation expression for the concentration. So we can write this as a hyperbolic uh, sign of this, because hyperbolic sign is uh, uh, this exponential minus this over two. So we have this expression. And can, we can rearrange that, defining, for example, this uh, kappa, the, the square kappa, uh, that is related to the size of the double layer, as we're, we are going to see. We, we can uh, rearrange and, and write in this capital X, that is the, uh, the non-dimensional distance, and this is the non-dimensional uh, potential. So we can write the simpler expression that uh, has a, an analytical solution. So for this simple case of uh, one uh, flat surface, uh, uh, 
uniform dielectric constant and symmetric electrolyte, we can uh, uh, find the analytical solution. So I bring here the analytical solution. So a, a good exercise for you students, you are, um, most part of you are physicists, so you are better than me finding analytical solutions. You can deduce this analytical solution. It's a good exercise. So here what, what I bring to you is directly the uh, uh, analytical solution. Sorry for the different notation, this is uh, bulk, uh, bulk, no, the, the, no, the, no it's, it's not different, it's okay. This is the surface potential. Okay, so we can we can use this expression to uh, uh, to plot the, the solution of fosson boltzmann equation, and uh, if people use, uh, sometimes use the linearized fosson boltzmann equation. There is the so-called the Bayhikyo uh, equation. Uh, so linearizing here, we uh, substitute this hyperbolic sine of phi by phi, so we can expand hyperbolic sine in a series. So we have phi, if, if we get a series expansion here, for example. So when we linearize the, the poisson boltzmann equation, we uh, consider only this first term. So we consider that instead of hyperbolic sign, we have directly phi, so we substitute this in this equation. And it's much easier to find the analytical solution of this equation. So we have this expression here, the surface potential times uh, the exponential of minus kappa times x. But this is not always uh, right. Uh, and I ask you, when is this approximation good? when the potential is small. Because here we have uh, phi to the third. So uh, this is, uh, if this is small, this is even smaller, much smaller. So we, we need to have a low uh, uh, electrostatic potential in order, in order to, apply, to apply this uh, the simplification. And here we have the expression of the free energy. So if we get the electrostatic profile, we can calculate free energy, we can calculate the potential of me, the potential of me force, so we calculate the energy interaction between this, those two particles. We are talking about two particles here. So we have this uh, electric contribution, this non-electrostatic contribution, and this is the entropic contribution, okay? And uh, if, if we, we prefer to, uh, to work with force instead of energy, we just need to uh, uh, differentiate this uh, expression with respect to L. That, that would be the distance between those two surfaces, okay? So we can, we can see that solving poisson boltzmann equation, we get the electrostatic contribution uh, of the, the potential of mean force between those particles. And uh, summing this to the Hamaker contribution, we have the whole picture of the LBO theory. And uh, if, if we have the, uh, the nonlinear Poisson Boltzmann equation, we can, uh, we can uh, solve it uh, numerically. We usually use finite difference method, finite volume method, or finite element method. There are other methods that, that can be used as well. So remembering that a poisson boltzmann equation is an elliptic uh, second order partial derivative equation. And those are the, the most used discretization methods that we can apply. So for example, if we use uh, a finite volume method, we consider here a finite volume with its neighbors at east, west, north, and south. And uh, we can consider a balance of the property between those, those, those neighbors. And we integrate this in volume in, uh, in the different uh, uh, directions. For example, here we are considering a two dimensions system. 
So we integrate in x and y, and we get this kind of expression. There is a linear system. Why is it a linear system? We have here the, the so-called source term that in, in Poisson Boltzmann theory, it would be this right-hand side here, or in this equation, it would be this right-hand side. It's a nonlinear uh, so, uh, term. So we have this, the nonlinear source term that we can linearize around the point P. There is the center of the volume that we are integrating. Uh, so when we do this kind of linearization, we have to solve uh, many sequential uh, uh, linear systems. So we, we do it iteratively, solving the linear systems. And when, when it converges, it's equal to the solution of the nonlinear system. So we solve the nonlinear Poisson Boltzmann equation. Okay. That doesn't have an elliptical solution in other cases, in other geometries, or considering other items. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, Hofmeister effects as well. It's the main theme of, of this sequence of lectures. So uh, this is Franz Hof, Hofmeister. And at the 1880s, he uh, studied protein solutions. And uh, he, uh, he discovered that the interaction between those proteins are more affected by some ions than by other ions. So it depends on the type of those ions. He called lyotropic series, and we usually call Hofmeister series. So this is the Hofmeister series for cations, this is for divalent anions, and this is for monovalent anions. For example, this means that iodide is more effective in precipitating proteins than chloride. But uh, take care. It depends on the isoelectric point of the protein and in, in what pH you are, uh, 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 you are studying your system. Because if, if we, you cross the isoelectric point, the series can be inverted. Okay? We are going to talk about this in the next classes. Uh, so in, and those uh, effects are very common in biology, in biochemistry, in chemical engineering, chemistry. So we are going to see many examples in the third class. Okay, and uh, if we get, for example, those the, the series of paper of Matthias Bostrom, he uh, concludes that when van der Waals interactions between ions and surface are treated at the same nonlinear level as the electrostatic interactions, or say, uh, or, uh, I mean. Uh, they are included in the Poisson Boltzmann equation. When we can do that, the orange of ion specific effects finally comes into sight. So, we are going to see uh, uh, tomorrow how to include other contributions, other than electrostatic contributions, in Poisson Boltzmann equation or in DFT calculations as well, so that we can analyze uh, those effects. Uh, the, uh, those ion specific, those Hofmeister effects, okay? Because for now, the only ion specific properties that we, we have in Poisson Boltzmann equation, for example, is the ion valence. So uh, for, for the classical Poisson Boltzmann equation, chloride is equal to iodide. So we need to, to uh, add other contributions so that we have those ion specific uh, uh, properties. And uh, in DFT, we can say that uh, the ion specific is accounted for uh, in ion valence and also ion size. But we can add all, all their contributions as well. Uh, so addressing of Meister effects require other ion surface interactions, as it will be discussed in, ne in the next lecture. And uh, this is a spoiler of the next lecture. Uh, so we can, we can compare here our, our results to uh, experimental results, and we see that for low ion concentrations, low ionic force, we get very good results using uh, Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Of course, as we increase concentration, Poisson-Boltzmann is not enough. We need a better theory, but for low concentration, we can get uh, uh, this kind of interaction. We are going to talk about this in details in the next lectures. Uh, but 
we, what we did here was to calculate the force between the particles using this approach that I showed today. And we calculate the energy integrating. So this is the potential of mean force calculated from poisson boltzmann equation. We add Hamaker interactions, hard sphere interactions, and we integrate again to get the second, uh, the osmotic second virial coefficient that is related to the interaction between two particles, or in this case, between two uh, proteins, okay? So this is the end, the end of my first lecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? You're waiting for a coffee break? Okay. There are no questions. You, you can talk to me during the coffee break or on the next uh, lectures. Thank you. <laughs>